The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's iteration of the Public Health Webinar Series Muted. Disorders. This webinar is presented by the Division of Blood Disorders at the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC. I'm David Garcia, and I'm a professor of medicine and division of hematology at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle. I also serve as assistant medical director for antithrombotic therapy at the UW Medical Center. I am delighted today to be joined by colleagues, Dr. Kristen Sanfilippo and Dr. Adam Sucker. Dr. Sanfilippo is assistant professor of medicine in the division of hematology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Dr. Sucker is associate professor of medicine and pathology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He is also the director of the Penn Comprehensive Hemophilia and Thrombosis Program. We are delighted that each of you could be with us today to discuss the latest information about the risk of thrombosis in patients with COVID-19. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping points and helpful tips for this webinar. After joining, you will see two audio options. You can opt to listen via the speakers on your computer or by using your phone to call in. If you choose the phone option, the webinar toolbar will provide you with the phone and access number, as well as an audio pin. All audio will be muted for attendees. At the end of the presentation, there will be lots of time for questions, and we encourage you to submit those. To submit a written question, please use the questions area of your toolbar. Our presenters will respond to as many questions as time permits. Today's webinar will last approximately one hour, and please note it is being recorded. We're going to now begin with two brief audience polls. First, we're interested in knowing more about each of you. Which of the following statements best describes you? Select one or more. So it looks we have like we have about six two thirds um, healthcare providers, twelve percent public health professionals, uh, eight percent with a family member who's had a venous thromboembolic event, and uh, some industry partners as well as community-based organization representatives as well. Wonderful. We have a second poll question now. And that is to find out where our attendees are from. Please select one of the regions listed here. So not surprisingly, 95% of our uh, attendees are from North America but we do have uh, some colleagues joining us from around the world as uh, shown in the slide here. Great, so thanks for helping us uh, answer those poll questions. And now uh, I think it is time for us to begin with the first presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna give the first uh, presentation today, and I'm going to show a few slides about possible reasons that patients with COVID-19 might develop uh, thrombosis. And I should preface my comments by saying I am neither a virologist nor a basic scientist, but I, I am ab as fascinated as I'm sure many of you are on this call as to uh, why we have been seeing the sorts of reports of thrombotic events in individuals, particularly those with severe forms of this particular viral infection. I don't have anything uh, to disclose, and um, I'm gonna just jump right into the organization of my talk. So uh, the outline of what I'm gonna say today is really to, first of all, clarify that it's very important when we discuss thrombotic events in patients with severe SARS-CoV-2 infection, 
that we specify what we're referring to when we talk about thrombosis, and I'll explain that uh, a bit more. Then I'm going to talk about two uh, high-level mechanisms by which one could speculate that SARS-CoV-2, uh, particularly in severe COVID-19, could lead to thrombotic events. One having to do at the cellular level with a very specific interaction between a spike protein on the viral surface and receptors on endothelial cells, and the second having more to do with a generalized host inflammatory response. So probably most people on the call are aware that individuals who uh, have this viral infection, particularly if it's severe, uh, have been noted in multiple different regions of the world to have very high D-dimer elevations in some cases. And it seems that this uh, particular biomarker finding is associated with an increased risk of death. However, the D-dimer elevation doesn't seem to be explained in most cases by a straightforward example of disseminated intravascular coagulation because while thrombocytopenia and protein prolongation can be observed, they're usually mild and fibrinogen and factor VIII, if anything, tend to be increased rather than consumed as one would expect in more typical DIC. The other interesting observation that clinicians have made is that a disproportionate number of the venous thromboembolic cases seem to have been uh, pulmonary embolism. Ordinarily, when we talk about DVT or PE in association with uh, critical illness, we uh, see about two cases of DVT for every one clinically apparent case of pulmonary embolism. And COVID-19 appears to be very much uh, flipped with respect to that ratio. And when we think about why this might be, uh, I'd like you to have a few ideas in mind as I go through the rest of my slides. One is that as I'm going to show you in the coming slides, this virus has the potential to cause significant endothelial damage. And as a result of that, could certainly be causing in situ, uh, particularly microvascular thrombosis within the lung parenchyma. Uh, and then the second is, of course, that it's possible the virus through any number of mechanisms is leading to DVT and of the lower extremities, which is being underappreciated uh, for various logistical reasons by clinicians, and that, that, that those DVTs are embolizing to the lungs and being detected more frequently. Now, one point I want to make here is that, as I said at the outset, there are very different manifestations of thrombosis that could all fall within some umbrella term. We have to be careful that we understand most of what we're discussing today, and particularly what Drs. Sucre and Sanfilippo are going to cover, has to do with venous thrombosis. But as I'm going to show you in the coming slides, there's a lot of evidence that this virus has a particular potential to cause microvascular thrombosis, which I am suggesting, and this is only my hypothesis, but I'm suggesting may have minimal uh, to little overlap with the pathophysiology that leads to what we typically think of in clinical practice as DVT or PE. Of course, you're also all probably familiar, there have been descriptions of arterial events, thrombotic events in patients with COVID-19, and then even perhaps more mysterious is the pathophysi pathophysiology behind the excess extracorporeal circuit thrombotic events or occlusive events that seem to be happening in a disproportionate number of these patients. And the degree to which the pathophysiology overlaps or is different among these different forms of thromboembolism is unknown. But I would ask you to keep an open mind to the possibility that there might be very little overlap in some or all of these categories. Now, again, from a non-virologist, um, it is important to understand that the way this virus enters the host cell is by having its major glycoprotein, the so-called spike protein on its surface, interact with what's called the ACE2 or angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, which is highly expressed on endothelial cells. There are apparently some other enzymatic reactions that have to take place, but this interaction between the spike protein and the ACE2 receptor is a sine qua non, apparently, for this virus to be internalized and cause its uh, pathology. 
<clears throat> Indeed, uh, it, it's not surprising that investigators such as the ones cited in this slide, the ones cited in this slide have observed that viral elements as well as inflammatory cells have been demonstrated in or around the endothelial lining of numerous organs, including not only the lung, but also the kidney, heart, intestine, and liver. Uh, viral particles appear to be able to cause both apoptosis of the endothelial cells as well as possible host immune-mediated destruction of, or damage to endothelium. It's unclear which of those two mechanisms is most important. But what is clear is that uh, this endothelial uh, pathology can lead to uh, at least microvascular, if not macrovascular, thrombosis. And this is a very elegant study published somewhat recently in the New England Journal of Medicine in which seven patients who succumbed to ARDS from COVID-19 were autopsied. And their uh, lungs were compared at autopsy to seven individuals who died from ARDS related to influenza, as well as to some persons who died uh, from reasons unrelated to lung pathology. And what you can see in this slide is that there is a significant amount of fibrin deposition in this particular patient. This was a 78-year-old man who died on hospital day three, who has a tremendous amount of fibrin deposited in the uh, capillaries uh, of the lung, as well as fibrin extravasating into the alveolar space with uh, red cells. And you might say, well, that's not surprising. Anybody with diffuse alveolar damage and ARDS is going to have fibrin in their lung tissue, which is true. But what was clever about the, this beautiful study done by these investigators is they actually quantified the capillary microthrombi in the COVID-19 cases and found that they were nine times more prevalent using an objective scale than uh, the corresponding capillary microthrombi in persons dying from influenza-associated ARDS. The same study also produced these beautiful pictures showing uh, in panel A, an electron micrograph that's been colorized. The tiny yellow uh, particles are lymphocytes and uh, the asterisk denotes a clot obstructing this capillary in the lung parenchyma. Um, an H&E stain of a similar uh, part of the tissue shows, again, the thrombi occluding small blood vessels with significant perivascular lymphocyte uh, infiltration. The lower panels here show a normal uh, subsegmental pulmonary artery in red and airway uh, in blue. Uh, and the COVID-19 infected patient uh, uh, in panel C, you can see has extensive but non-occlusive um, uh, changes in the subsegmental pulmonary arteries out of proportion to those in the airways, uh, suggesting that there is non-occlusive thrombus affecting a large segment of this very small branch of a branch of a branch, if you will, of the uh, main pulmonary artery. Now, uh, the, the, the last study I showed you suggests that um, direct endothelial damage uh, uh, by the virus and or perivascular lymphocytic uh, infiltrate may be mediating uh, the thrombosis that we're seeing in these small blood vessels, but some other investigators have invoked complement as a possible culprit. And uh, this is a study of five individuals who died after having ARDS as well as this characteristic purpuric skin rash uh, on some part of their body shown in panel A. And these investigators um, biopsied both the lungs and in this case, we're looking at skin tissue and found that again, small blood vessels were uh, affected in many cases by occlusive thrombus, but they also found the tremendous amount of staining for complement. In this case, both C4D as well as the C59 uh, complement complex is shown in these various subcutaneous uh, uh, panels. And um, a very recent paper uh, also suggests that complement may have an important uh, role in pathology here. What these investigators did is <clears throat> exposed some cells that uh, are very dependent on uh, 
avoiding complement activation to survive to two different subunits of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Panel A is subunit one and panel B is subunit two. And in both cases, when they ran this so-called modified HAM test, on the x-axis, we see increasing concentrations of the spike um, protein subunit. And on the y-axis, we see the percent cell death. And you see that as the there more and more spike protein subunit is added, there's more and more cell killing. This cell killing is abrogated uh, or, or eliminated almost by the addition of an anti-CD, uh, excuse me, anti-C5 antibody, um, suggesting that C5 and that part of the complement uh, activation system may be playing an important role uh, in COVID-associated pathology. Okay, so we've talked now a lot about what's going on at the cellular level and in the very small capillaries and blood vessels. And it's indeed possible that much of this action, if you will, at the endothelium is also producing the uh, signal of excess thrombosis in larger blood vessels, deep veins of the legs, coronary arteries, et cetera. However, I wanna suggest to you that there might be um, other explanations for why we're seeing somewhat higher rates of uh, macrovascular thrombosis, particularly of pulmonary embolism uh, in these patients who are very sick with SARS-CoV-2. One possibility is that we're simply looking for pulmonary embolism more. Uh, again, concern about PE has been raised because of the D-dimer uh, observations uh, and some misunderstandings about the significance of D-dimer elevation. Uh, of course, these patients have a profound impairment in gas exchange due to diffuse alveolar damage and possibly also to this microvascular thrombosis I just pointed out. So it's not difficult to imagine that um, uh, clinicians would suspect pulmonary embolism and evaluate patients for that, uh, perhaps with a lower threshold uh, than in other illnesses. But the other thing that I wanna just close with is that patients who develop the severe form of this disease become extremely sick. And uh, of course, it shouldn't come as news to anyone listening that a patient with severe critical illness can develop DVT or PE despite optimal uh, thromboprophylaxis. And I think it's my opinion that that may be a significant explanation for the clinical events that are being observed. So one thing I learned that I'm gonna close with about the, the biology of this virus is that um, using some mouse experiments, actually SARS-CoV-1, the SARS coronavirus that uh, was a big deal 15 or so years ago, um, was actually exposed to mice. And it was shown that if the mice had either using exogenous type 1 interferon or their own type 1 interferon, a, a good, brisk, immediate response, the viral load was controlled and the disease was not severe. However, in this mouse model, if there was a delay in the interferon response, type one interferon response, and apparently both SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2 have ways of slowing down the host uh, type one interferon response, the viral titer can become extremely high such that by the time there is a type one interferon response, it's maladaptive and it leads to the recruitment of macrophages and monocytes and other um, systemic inflammatory response that proves to be uh, very dangerous and could certainly explain uh, a DVT-PE signal, among many other things. Uh, this mouse model also showed that if you expose mice who have a knockout for type 1 interferon receptors, uh, they get a significant viral titer, but they don't develop severe disease. So I will close my portion of today's uh, discussion by summarizing that um, to the extent that DVT and PE risk uh, is or are increased with this infection, and Adam's gonna tell us a lot more about that coming up, the increase in my opinion is likely explained by virulence and the mechanisms that are typical of the systemic inflammatory response syndrome and should be, uh, this type of thrombosis should be um, uh, amenable to uh, prevention with either prophylactic anticoagulants or anti-inflammatory agents. At least that would be a biologically reasonable approach. On the other hand, 
the widespread microvascular thrombosis that we're learning more and more about in this SARS-CoV-2 infection may be as important as, say, typical DVT or PE, but it may or may not respond to the traditional anticoagulant or anti-inflammatory interventions that we've used in other diseases. And I think we need to learn a lot more about that before we simply presume that it's a disease process that would respond, for example, to uh, heparin, low molecular weight heparin, or other anticoagulants. And then lastly, uh, I would just say that we have much more to learn about the pathophysiology of the arterial and extracorporeal thrombotic events that are occurring in patients with severe COVID-19. So with that, I wanna quickly now move to our next presentation, which is going to again be given by my friend and colleague, Dr. Adam Sucker, who's gonna talk about how much is the risk of thr venous thrombosis really increased in this disease? Adam? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Garcia, and I enjoyed your presentation of a complex and poorly understood topic. Uh, and I wanna thank you and the CDC for inviting me to speak about another hot topic. What is the risk of venous thromboembolism or VTE in patients with COVID-19? So um, as Dr. Garcia pointed out in his presentation uh, just a moment ago, uh, there are diverse thrombotic manifestations associated with COVID-19, which may have different pathophysiologic mechanisms. Today, we're going to be focusing on deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. But as Dr. Garcia pointed out, critically ill patients in the ICU with, uh, on CRRT or ECMO have very high rates of circuit thrombosis. Um, he also noted that autopsies show a high frequency of microvascular thrombosis with a particular predilection for the pulmonary arterioles. Um, arterial thromboembolic events have also been observed with this disease, for example, acute ischemic stroke. And then some of you may be aware of this mysterious condition called COVID toe syndrome, where patients present with digital ischemia, often in the convalescent phase of the infection. But again, for the purposes of my presentation, I'm going to be focusing on deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. And importantly, I am not going to distinguish pulmonary embolism from in situ pulmonary artery thrombosis. I'm going to refer to those entities collectively as pulmonary embolism. So there are probably a number of risk factors for COVID-19 associated venous thromboembolism, but the most important risk factor, the one that really trumps all of the others, is the severity of illness. The sicker the patient is, the greater the risk of VTE, and that is the purpose of this figure that I'm about to show you. So at the highest risk are patients with COVID-19 associated critical illness, usually found in the intensive care unit. We work our way down the list. Patients who are sick enough to be hospitalized with COVID-19 acute illness, but not in the ICU, on the wards, have a somewhat lower risk of thrombosis. Another population of interest is patients who are discharged from the hospital and are recovering from COVID-19 infection and the risk of post-hospital discharge thrombosis. And finally, what about the risk of thrombosis in non-hospitalized individuals with SARS-CoV-2 infection who are either asymptomatic or not sufficiently sick to require admission to the hospital? So this figure is meant not to imply a linear increase in the risk of thrombosis among these four populations, but generally an increase as patients get sicker, the risk of VTE increases. And so what I wanna do now is take you through the incidence of VTE or what we know about it in each of these four populations. So we'll start with critically ill patients in the ICU. And so this is a forest plot from a systematic review and meta-analysis of seven studies of patients with COVID-19 associated critical illness. And almost all of these patients were treated with prophylactic anticoagulation, the standard of care for patients in the ICU. And despite that, we see a pooled incidence of VTE in this group of 24%, with a 95% confidence interval of 16 to 35%. So that sounds like a high incidence, right? But the question then becomes, well, 
is the risk of VTE actually greater in critically ill COVID-19 patients than it is in critically ill patients with co without COVID-19? After all, we know that co uh, critical illness by itself is a risk factor for thrombosis. And so this table summarizes the best evidence that we have. Again, you can see in patients with COVID-19 related critical illness, a 24% incidence of VTE. A systematic review and meta-analysis of critically ill patients without COVID-19 who were receiving prophylactic intensity anticoagulation shows an incidence of breakthrough VTE of 6%. So if you are to look at these numbers, just the raw numbers, you might say, wow, 24%, that's four times higher than 6%. So patients with COVID-19 related critical illness appear to be about fourfold greater risk for VTE than critically ill patients without COVID. But we have to be cautious in drawing that conclusion. And the reason is we need to consider the type of evidence that's leading to these estimates. The non-COVID-19 evidence comes from high quality randomized control trials with low risk of bias. On the other hand, the COVID-19 data comes from observational studies, many low quality with high risk of bias. And I want to dive into that just a bit more on the next slide. So the authors of this systematic review and meta-analysis conducted a formal assessment of the quality of studies that they included in their systematic review using a standardized tool called the MINERS criteria. And the studies were therefore judged as adequate, inadequate, or unclear in terms of risk of bias across the domains that you see listed here. And those studies that were judged to be inadequate in the middle shade of gray or unclear the dark shade of gray are shown in the graph here. And you can see there are a lot of studies that made the systematic review that were judged to be inadequate or unclear with respect to these various domains. I want to highlight just a few for you. First is the inclusion of consecutive patients. A number of these studies did not include consecutive patients. They cherry-picked patients based on certain eligibility criteria, which may have enriched their population for VTE. And we call that selection bias. And so that can lead to an inflated estimate of the risk of the outcome. Another important limitation of many of these studies is assessment of the study endpoint. So in real world practice, for example, we only do ultrasound if a patient has signs or symptoms to suggest a lower extremity DVT. But in some of these studies, patients may have undergone screening ultrasound. That is, they ultrasounded all patients even those who are asymptomatic. And in some cases, they may have identified silent DVT that may or may not have any clinical relevance. And so um, that sort of outcome measurement bias can also inflate the estimate uh, of the outcome. Bear with me for a moment, there we go. So now I want to, with those limitations in mind, move to the next group of patients, patients uh, with acute COVID-19 associated illness, who we would usually find on the hospital wards. And so here is a forest plot from the same publication, four studies of patients with COVID-19 related acute illness with a pooled estimate of venous thromboembolism of 9% with a 95% confidence interval of three to 22%. So once again, that sounds like a high number, but is the risk of venous thromboembolism actually greater in acutely ill COVID-19 patients than it is in acutely ill patients without COVID-19? And here again is a table summarizing the best available evidence. I showed you from the forest plot that we just looked at, a pooled estimate of 9% incidence of VTE in the acutely ill COVID patients, a systematic review and meta-analysis of high-quality randomized control trials showed that in acutely ill non-COVID-19 patients receiving prophylactic intensity anticoagulation, the incidence of VTE is about 0.7%. So once again, you might just look at these raw numbers and come to the conclusion that, yeah, the incidence of VTE appears to be substantially higher in acutely ill COVID-19 patients and in their non-COVID-19 counterparts. But once again, we have to remember the limitations of the evidence 
from which these estimates are drawn and the potential for this evidence to overinflate the incident, the true incidence of VTE in this population. So I now want to move on to the third population, the post-hospital discharge population. We know that when medical patients are discharged from the hospital, they are at increased risk of thrombosis, primarily in the 30 to 42 days after hospital discharge. So what is the risk of VTE in COVID-19 patients in the 30 to 42 days after hospital discharge? Well, there are three studies that have been reported that shed light on this question. The first is a small study from Belgium of 102 patients only 8% of whom were discharged on prophylactic anticoagulation. These patients all underwent ultrasound screening of their legs about a month after discharge. And one patient was found to have asymptomatic DVT by screening ultrasound. None of the patients had clinically symptomatic venous thromboembolism. In another study by Patel and colleagues, 163 patients in Boston, Again, only 8% discharged on prophylactic anticoagulation, and the incidence of post-discharge VTE was 0.6%. Finally, a larger study from the United Kingdom, 1,877 patients, none of whom was discharged on prophylactic anticoagulation, and the incidence of post-discharge VTE was only 0.5%. So taken together, these data suggest that the risk of post-discharge VTE in COVID-19 patients is quite low, despite the infrequent use of post-discharge anticoagulation. Finally, what about non-hospitalized patients? What is their risk? Well, this slide summarizes the evidence we have in this population. This space intentionally left blank because unfortunately we have no evidence currently on the risk of VTE in non-hospitalized patients, although there is evidence emerging at least among patients who were presented to the emergency room and then discharged. But we suspect that the risk of VTE in this population is likely to be quite low. As I've taken you through these, the first three groups of patients, you've seen that as the population becomes less sick, we see a reduced incidence of VTE. This is the population that is the least sick of all, and therefore it's likely to have the lowest risk of venous thromboembolism. So in conclusion, the baseline risk of COVID-19 associated VTE increases with illness severity. The best available evidence suggests that critically ill and acutely ill COVID-19 patients may have a several fold greater risk of VTE than their critically ill and acutely ill non-COVID-19 counterparts. But we have to be very cautious in making that conclusion because the evidence in COVID-19 is of limited quality and at high risk for bias, as we discussed. The risk of VTE in COVID-19 patients after hospital discharge appears to be quite low, probably less than 1%, despite the infrequent use of post-discharge anticoagulation. And finally, there is no evidence on the risk of VTE in non-hospitalized COVID-19 patients, though it is likely to be very low. So I'm going to uh, conclude here. I thank you for your attention, and it's now my pleasure to turn the podium over to Dr. San Filippo. Thank you, Dr. Sucker. I would like to thank my colleagues as well as the CDC for inviting me to give this presentation. We're gonna to conclude today's webinar talking about what the current guidance statements are for prevention of venous thromboembolism in patients with COVID-19. Before we go into it, I just want to start by differentiating a clinical guideline from a clinical guidance statement. So a clinical guideline addresses a topic in which there's moderate to high quality evidence informing best practice, typically in the form of well-developed, well-designed, randomized control trials, and employs a structured process to summarize this evidence, usually by systematic review. Conversely, clinical guidance statements, while also aiming to cover a clinically important topic of broad interest, lack high quality evidence to support recommendations and are typically based on expert opinion. 
In the setting of COVID-19 and the rapidity at which it became a world crisis, there was a motion to disseminate information in a timely and rapid fashion. This has led to a wealth of information regarding venous thromboembolism in patients with COVID-19. However, as Dr. Sucre just presented, the majority of this evidence is in the form of observational studies and what would be considered overall lower quality evidence. And thus guidance statements have been developed to assist providers in preventing and managing thrombosis in patients with COVID-19. Some of the samples of current available published guidance statements are listed here. And moving forward, we'll focus on five of these to discuss primary thromboprophylaxis in COVID-19. I will start with the highest risk group consisting of critically ill hospitalized patients and work down to the lower risk group, as the guidance statements tend to be most unified within critically ill patients and start to differentiate slightly more as risk of venous thromboembolism decreases. So looking at these five available guidance statements, all five agree that in critically ill hospitalized patients with COVID-19, Anticoagulant primary thromboprophylaxis should be utilized with a preference for low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin and consideration of intermittent compression devices in those patients who have contraindications to anticoagulation. When looking at intensity recommendations for anticoagulation, the majority of the guidelines agree that standard doses should be utilized an example of the standard dose would include anoxaparin 40 milligrams once daily, unfractionated heparin 5,000 units every eight hours. However, the anticoagulation forum and some of the panelists within the ISTH scientific subcommittee and the global COVID-19 thrombosis collaborative group favor consideration of intermediate dose anticoagulation with examples listed here. So anoxaparin 40 milligrams BID or unfractionated heparin 7,500 units every eight hours. So is there evidence for this um, differentiation and recommendations predominantly for intermediate dosing? The majority of this is based off of, again, the concern for the high risk of venous thromboembolism in this population. And that risk was highlighted by the studies that Dr. Sucre presented, as well as another example um, by Helms and colleagues. So in this study, they looked at the overall risk of venous thromboembolism in patients with COVID-19 ARDS and compared it to patients with non-COVID-19 ARDS. Given inherent baseline um, differences, as this was a retrospective study, patients were propensity score matched, and we'll focus on that analysis, which is on the right of your screen. Overall, they found that patients with COVID-19 ARDS had about a threefold increased risk of venous thromboembolism compared to patients with non-COVID-19 ARDS that was statistically significant. The predominance of this risk was attributed to pulmonary embolism as screening ultrasound was not a routine component of this study. When looking at preventative measures used in these patients' populations, so both in the non-COVID-19 as well as the COVID-19 patient population, you can see the vast majority of patients received a standard dose of prophylactic anticoagulation, whereas a minority were treated with therapeutic dosing. And all patients in the study received some form of anticoagulant prophylaxis. So the overall conclusion of this was that despite our standard preventative measures for venous thromboembolism in critically ill patients, our current measures may be ineffective and thus higher doses such as intermediate dose may be reasonable. Part of the intermediate dosing has been an extrapolation from additional studies in alternate high-risk populations. So some of the high risk populations of consideration are patients who are morbidly obese, patients who um, are admitted for trauma as, as two main examples. And I'm gonna go over these two studies here um, to really showcase the outcomes using higher doses of prophylactic anticoagulation. So in the study on the left published by Wang and colleagues, 
patients who are morbidly obese with a BMI of at least 40 um, were retrospectively assessed to determine if a higher dose of anticoagulation, in this case intermediate dose, was more effective than standard dosing for prevention of venous thromboembolism. And you can see with the study that higher dosing was associated with almost a 50% reduction in the risk of venous thromboembolism, and there was no subsequent increased risk of bleeding within the study population. In this study published on the right, this is a population of patients undergoing laparoscopic bariatric surgery, another high-risk population, and they looked at two dosing strategies for anoxaparin. So in the black bar is 40 milligrams once daily, which is standard dosing, and in the white bar is 60 milligrams once daily, which is intermediate dosing. They looked at anti-10A levels after the first dose and after the third dose when patients um, were in you know, a state of, of having had several doses of the medication. And what they found after the first dose was that with standard therapy, 55% of patients were considered to have, um, they use the word subtherapeutic, but really an anti-10A level below what a prophylactic threshold goal is. This is in comparison to only 20% of patients that were in the intermediate dosing strategy. And after reaching a steady state after the third dose, 44% of patients on standard dosing remained subtherapeutic compared to 0% of patients um, on, the more, the, on the higher intermediate dosing strategy. So moving on to acutely ill hospitalized patients with COVID-19, again, all five of these guidance statements recommend use of um, primary thromboprophylaxis in this patient population. Um, some such as the anticoagulation forum stating regardless of any risk score stratification, whereas the global COVID-19 thrombosis collaborative group does recommend assessing risk of thrombosis. Again, low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin um, injectables are favored. When looking at the intensity, all guidelines predominantly favor a standard dose intensity and in what we have seen as this lower risk patient population. However, within the ISTH scientific subcommittee and within the global COVID-19 thrombosis collaborative group, about 30% of panelists favored continued consideration of intermediate dosing. In both of these critically ill as well as acutely ill, all guidelines recommend appropriate adjustments for underlying issues such as EGFR as well as patient weight. So what is the basis for the recommendations, the deviation um, for intermediate dosing in this patient population? Well, one of the studies published was the study by Tang and colleagues, which was um, one of the first studies to assess the effect of heparin on mortality, in this case, 28-day mortality, as highlighted on the y-axis, in patients with COVID-19. And what they found is that patients who received heparin in the blue graph or in the blue line um, versus those who were non-heparin users in the red line had overall lower 28-day mortality rates. However, this was only statistically significant in patients with higher degrees of illness, um, in this case as, as documented by a higher SIC score, or those patients who really had higher elevations of D-dimer, so in this study, at least six times the upper limit of normal. The authors also made it a point to note in the discussion that in general, um, COVID-19 or no COVID-19, Asian populations have an overall lower incidence of venous thromboembolism compared to alternate populations, and thus they stated higher doses of low molecular weight heparin could be a consideration in non-Asian populations. So this is really the best data at this point on the basis of this recommendation, again, highlighting the need for continued research within this area. Moving to the post-discharge patients with COVID-19 and focusing on implementation of extended thromboprophylaxis. So the majority of the guidelines recommend that this decision should really be made on a case-by-case -case basis and considered really for patients who have estimated high ongoing risk of venous thromboembolism coupled with a low bleeding risk. In regards to assessing who has a high risk um, for venous thromboembolism, 
these cited studies here had very well defined inclusion criteria identifying a higher risk patient population and thus when considered for COVID-19 patients referencing back to those inclusion criteria would be appropriate. An example of quantifying the bleeding risk could be with the improved bleed um, score with a value of less than seven, suggesting lower bleeding risk. Regimens recommended um, by the anticoagulation form in CDC are the FDA approved regimens, including vitrixaban, anoxaparin, and rivaroxaban. And again, these are the agents studied in these trials. Whereas the ISTH scientific subcommittee and the global COVID-19 thrombosis group broadened these categories to low molecular weight heparin or direct oral anticoagulation. These were studied for an average of um, really two weeks to about 45 days, so duration could be up to that in the recommendations. And the CHEST guidelines, however, did not recommend use of extended anticoagulation in patients with COVID-19 on discharge in the absence of additional data. So looking at the studies that have been done for extended thromboprophylaxis, again, this is, in, this is not um, for COVID-19 patients, but is for hospitalized medical patients. They found that in a meta-analysis that extended prophylaxis significantly decreases the risk of developing deep vein thrombosis in that one, to 45, one week to 45 day interval However, at the cost of doubling the risk of major bleeding over the same time window. Given the increased risk of major bleeding and the actual relatively low rate of venous thromboembolism within the studies, the majority of guidelines outside of COVID-19 have not adopted a strategy of extended prophylaxis. As just presented, we saw that in patients with COVID-19, when assessing the rate of venous thromboembolism following discharge, overall in the studies, despite low rates of extended prophylaxis, where over 90% of patients were not treated with prophylaxis following discharge, the rate of venous thromboembolism remained less than 1%, so an important consideration for this patient population. And then I'll just conclude um, with the last population, so non-hospitalized patients with COVID-19 or those who are quarantined at home for care. Um, only two of the guidance statements made recommendations, the CDC and the Global COVID-19 Thrombosis Collaborative Group, with the CDC recommending to not initiate primary thromboprophylaxis in patients not already on one of these agents. Whereas the global COVID-19 thrombosis group did recommend consideration on a case-by-case -case basis. And some of these deviations really are taking into consideration the patient being treated. So as we saw with some of our um, higher affected areas, especially New York City, um, Italy, the hospital systems became overwhelmed. Patients who would have typically been admitted to the hospital for care of an acute illness required management at home due to bed availability. Similarly, um, in the setting of patients admitted to the hospital who would have routinely been escalated to an intensive care unit, they may have not had room um, or position for them to go. And so you really have to think about the illness of your patient despite the setting that they're in. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I will hand it back over to Dr. Garcia to guide our question and answer session. Okay, I'd like to thank Adam and Kristen for two excellent presentations. And now quickly, we're going to move to question and answer. And I think I can categorize the various questions we've had into about four or five global questions that we can try to get through all of them in the next 12 minutes or so. So the first category of question is, given what we've just heard from all three speakers, um, why wouldn't one be more aggressive with um, anticoagulant prophylaxis, for example, giving therapeutic doses of unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin preemptively to selected patients with COVID-19, maybe those with a high D-dimer. Uh, Adam and Kristen, you wanna take a crack at that? Adam first. Sure, David, yeah, I can I can take a crack at that first. So, So let me say, I mean, that that's a natural question. And I think early on in the pandemic, we saw many institutions uh, 
um, developing protocols whereby sicker patients or patients with higher D-dimers were, were treated with higher intensities of anticoagulation. And I'd argue that was a natural response to what folks were seeing, which seemed to be a high rate of breakthrough thrombosis. But I think we need to be a little careful about um, codifying this into our standard of care for two reasons. First of all, we, we, we can presume that increasing the intensity of anticoagulation can cause harm, namely in the form of increased bleeding risk. And second of all, we don't actually know for certain uh, whether it's effective at reducing blood clotting events. As Dr. Garcia said, uh, noted in his presentation, um, inflammation appears to be a very important part of the, uh, of the thrombosis seen in patients with COVID-19. And it may be that increasing the dose of anticoagulation is not the most effective or safest means of reducing thrombosis. Maybe antiviral or anti-inflammatory or anti-cytokine or anti-complement therapy would be more effective. So um, while I don't criticize people for um, considering increasing the intensity of anticoagulation in high-risk patients, I think we need to be careful because we don't really know the efficacy and safety of that intervention. Yeah, and I will just echo what, what Adam said and, and agree with his points, again, that you have to remember that as we increase intensity, we are increasing potential risk. And as demonstrated um, nicely in his presentation, we looked at the overall quality of current evidence that we have. And while we are seeing alarming rates of venous thromboembolism um, that causes many of us to have high levels of concern, again, there was a high level of bias within these studies where patients were not always consecutively enrolled, um, and, and thus we may be seeing inflated rates in some of these studies. There is um, excellent opportunities, especially throughout the United States right now, to participate in high level, um, high quality clinical trials, assessing this question, directly assessing this question, you know, through the NIH, through other means, where we can really have a, a good answer to it as opposed to really treating ourselves and our level of concern. And I have nothing to add. Let's I just say let's test the hypothesis with prospective randomized controlled trials, which are being done, as uh, Kristen said. I'll take a shot at the next group of questions uh, first, which is, um, are patients with either inherited thrombophilia, such as someone with factor V Leiden mutation on one allele, or patients with a known history of prior DVT or PE, should we be thinking of them differently during this viral pandemic? Uh, for example, should we be putting them preemptively on anticoagulants? Should we put them on anticoagulants if they develop COVID-19 and are going to try to uh, ride it out at home if they have a milder case? Are they more likely to develop complications? Should they develop the SARS-CoV-2 infection? And, uh, and there are a number of questions on this topic. And what I, I get this question a lot uh, in some form or another. And what I tell patients uh, is the following. Someone who's already on an anticoagulant because they have a personal history of DVT or PE in some ways is, um, in, in the safest possible situation in the sense that they're already on the most powerful medicine we have, at least to prevent the traditional mac macrovascular uh, venous thromboembolic complications that, that have just been uh, described. Um, so I reassure such patients that they should stay on their therapeutic anticoagulants. And of course, if they get hospitalized, uh, that sort of therapy will be continued. Um, Patients who have, let's say, uh, knowledge that they have the one copy of the factor V Leiden mutation or the prothrombin gene mutation uh, should remember that while they have a slightly increased risk over their lifetime to develop DVT or PE, if they don't have a personal history of such, uh, I certainly don't think they should do anything differently as we live through this viral pandemic compared to, to anyone else. Uh, that might be a relevant piece of information for the treating doctors to consider if and when the patient becomes infected with the virus, 
but um, it's important to remember that uh, th those particular genetic traits are don't have a super strong association with DVT and uh, PE risk. Any other quick pearls that you guys uh, have on this topic? I'll start with Kristen. No, I, I absolutely agree with everything that you said, David. I don't have any highlights to add. Nothing to add for me either, David. Well covered. Great. Okay. Uh, and I think actually we're doing great on time here because we just have one more um, uh, category to go into, and that comes back to this question of post-discharge prophylaxis. So one of our attendees asked uh, Adam specifically, when you looked at the uh, evidence on this subject, were there any subgroup analyses of people who needed ICU care and were then discharged? And might they be a subgroup uh, who would benefit from post-discharge prophylaxis? Related to that, another person asked, might individuals who are morbidly obese or have immunocompromise or other uh, characteristics known to be associated with higher risk of mortality in COVID-19 be a group that could benefit? And Adam, I wonder if you want to comment on any of that. Sure. Um, so those are very reasonable questions. I would say that the, the data that we have, um, fairly uh, scant though it is, is reassuring. Um, if, if, if you remember the slide that I showed on the three studies of uh, looking at the rates of post-discharge VT, the rates are incredibly low, 1% or less. And, and we're talking about just a handful of events or one or two events per study. And yes, these studies did look at subgroups like patients who had been in the ICU during their hospital course. And um, because of the very small number of events, they did not notice any particular differences among those subgroups. They did not see a signal for higher risk of post-discharge VTE among those subgroups. Again, I think when we look at the data as a whole, limited though it is, it suggests that just about everybody who's discharged from the hospital of VTE collectively has quite a low risk of, of VTE. And so I think that um, these data would really suggest that we probably don't need to be routinely using post-discharge prophylaxis. And I'm not even sure that there's a high risk population that we can define at this point that would warrant post-discharge prophylaxis based on available data. Yeah, the, I would just uh, echo that and also say that uh, my approach for patients who are well enough to leave the hospital is to look at them just like I would look at any patient who has been admitted for an acute medical illness. And um, there probably is a subgroup of such patients, COVID-19 or, or not, who have such a high risk for post-discharge prophylaxis that they might benefit from some sort of low-dose anticoagulant. But it's, it's a, probably a very small population, and I suspect, again, using criteria uh, that uh, Kristen alluded to in her talk um, would be the appropriate way to select such individuals rather than factoring in uh, the fact that they were or were not admitted for COVID-19. So guys, I think uh, I'd like to thank each of you as our speakers, as well as our attendees for joining us today. We also send a special thanks to our colleagues at the Center for Disease Control Division of Blood Disorders and the National Blood Clot Alliance, who co-hosted today's webinar. Very shortly, each of you will receive an email asking for feedback, and we hope you'll respond with your comments. If you have additional questions about today's presentation, please contact Cynthia Sayers at csayers, S-A-Y-E-R-S, at cdc.gov. Today's webinar is going to be archived and the content will soon be available at the CDC's Division of Blood Disorders website as shown on the slide. Thank you for joining us and have a great afternoon.